Radio Days Africa 2020 is about to go live. Welcome, guys. Welcome to Radio Days Africa 2020, the new normal. It's Africa's largest radio conference, now in its 11th year. It's brought to you by the Wits Radio Academy under the auspices of the Department of Journalism at Wits University. We'd like to thank our partners and our sponsors. They include the Conrad Adenauer Institute, as well as OCS Africa, Iona FM, the Abundant Media Group, and Crossfade Studios, who are joining us today from Cape Town as well. A reminder, you can register for all your Radio Days Africa sessions at www.radiodaysafrica.co.za. You can follow us on Facebook at the Wits Radio Academy Facebook page, and on Twitter at Radio Days Africa with the hashtags RDA2020 and hashtag the new normal. And look out for today's session, we'd really appreciate your voice notes on WhatsApp. In South Africa, you can dial 079-258, uh, rather 528-0000, that's 079-528-0000. If you're dialing in from outside the country, international code is 0027 79 And for all your questions and comments for today's session, you can use the messaging and the Q&A functions just at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen page. Well, today's session is drop the treble and pump up the bass. You know, in radio, uh, I started out in this area and there are pretty much two departments in radio that go uncelebrated. One is the traffic department and these aren't the guys who, who do the traffic reports about late trains or planes. I'm talking about commercial traffic, uh, the department that puts together the commercial log and all the ads and spots and libraries and all the money related stuff. And the other uncelebrated bunch is what we do, is what we're doing today is the audio and sound production teams who, unbeknownst to most, are the specialists that kind of mess with your brain with sound. You know, sound being part of our sixth sense, part of our sixth senses. We really do take for granted the oral experience of hearing and listening consciously and subconsciously, and how sound plays a definitive role in our daily human experience. And today we'll hear how we use and manipulate and twist this oral and audible frequency stuff to achieve our messages across radio stations and in our entertainment side as well. And please, you can message us, pass us on questions, and don't forget the voice notes as well. Our two expert guests today in Drop the Treble, Pump Up the Bass are Lindsay Johnson. He's the studio owner and audio producer at Crossfade Studios in Cape Town. He started out originally at KFM. Uh, did station imaging and production for KFM. Then he moved on to uh, the group kind of imaging at Prime Media. He did station imaging for 702, 947, 557 Cape Talk. In uh, the more recent time, he's designed uh, the launch imaging and current imaging for Smile FM in Cape Town. In 2017, he established uh, Crossway Studios. And earlier this year, he joined the Benstown team producing station imaging for their international clients. And our second guest is Andy Sonnemann. He's the CEO of Benstown, straight out of Stuttgart in Germany. It's kind of that German audio engineering when you need it most. Um, he's the CEO of Benstown. They deliver audio branding and imaging products to almost 2,600 clients across five continents. And he's the creator behind the proprietary industry-leading web-based imaging solution called Benstown Branding. And it's used by thousands of stations across the globe. So we've got two pretty big heavy hitters today joining us for Drop the Treble, Pump Up the Bass. So guys, you're gonna do your presentation and we'll do some Q&A straight after that. Over to you. Thanks, Neil. So I think we decided to switch that in two parts. So as I'm gonna be the more boring guy and do the theoretical part, so Lindsay can give you some more interesting nitty gritty on the Pro Tools later. So I think as we're like a little bit in a rush that we, Neil wants to do a lot of q and I'll just jump right into it. And uh, for me, it's really important that we address the topic so everybody could get something out of it. Even if you're an imaging director, if you're like a programmer, if you work with imaging directors, no matter what your actual job is in, in the radio station, I really want you to understand more of what Lindsay and I do on a daily basis as you either have to work with us or you're in the same seat. So that's why I think the theoretic part is a good thing to kick it off. And for me, um, I'm meeting this uh, request like all the time and I'm getting this on my blog and in emails and it's like my stations doing the relaunches and flips. It's kind of like, how do you create a unique sound for a radio station, right? That's like a loaded question. How do you design an acoustic brand that's memorable and rocks? That's what you're getting more from the, from the TV and from the advertorial side of things, but it's all kind of like the same. So we talk about the audio design here, guys. And um, 
there is a pretty simple process I use and I wanted to share and hopefully like you can use that for your stations or for your products. You want to feature audio eyes and create a better audio brand for it as well. So the first thing for me is really the brand and market analyzes and competitor analyzes. So that means you need to start with your own brand, right? It means define your core values. So what does your brand stand for? That's really important, even if it might sound pretty theoretical, but if your stand sounds for lifestyle, or hit music is totally different. The sound design is going to be totally different than if you just play only hit music, right? I mean, it's really important. So define the core values of your brand and everybody can do this exercise for himself. No need for me to explain that, but it's really important that you know what your brand stands for. Then the second part is you should define and really clearly write this out. I'm a fan of writing stuff out so you have it in front of you, but you can do it as you wish. Know your target, right? Who are the people you're communicating with? Who are the people you want to reach? What language do they speak? Where do they go for, for lunch? Like, what, what, what do they love to do, right? Like, what does your target group look like? Really important. Doesn't sound really important for a sound designer, but is. So make sure you understand, like, what they watch on Netflix, what worlds they live in, basically, right? That's the first part. So start with your brand, first part. Second part is analyze your competition. Really important if you do like start a new station in a busy market or you, if you flip a station to a new format, it's really interesting and really important so you know what is your competition actually doing sound-wise, right? How do they sound overall? Is it busy, relaxed? Is it straightforward? Is it playful? How do, you, how do they approach the listener in their messaging, right? Like how do they talk to people? What elements do they use on air? What is special about them? What do they well? What do they don't not so well, maybe? So it's really important. So analyze the competition on a broader scheme and then break it down and see like what production techniques do they use? Like you don't, if you want to create a unique brand, you don't want to copy that, right? You don't want to be number two. Basically, you copy, copy cat. You want to be number one. You want to be unique. You want to be special. You want to be recognizable, remarkable. So what do they do? How do they produce? What type of VO do they use? What type of bats do they use for the promos, trailers, for the elements in between? What sound effects? Do they work with listeners? Is this the artist driven? So really make sure, number two, that you analyze your competition and that you know where they're sitting. And then third part is, of course, the market. So you should understand, you should have research data about the market, see the blind spots, where you can basically go, where, it's, where are your options to position that, right? How do you position your program against competitors and this is not a research panel, but it's really important. So you need to see the spots you can maybe hone in and, and be for. And Lindsay, I think we need to go back one slide now for the next, uh, for the next thing. So um, the next step after you've done this analysis of brand, market, and competitor is basically define your sound. I, I used an example I, I, did for, um, I did for a car company back in the days, but it's also doable for, for a radio station, right? So the, the interesting part is coming in now. If we talk about a radio station or music, let's talk about music you want to use. What genre of music do you use in your actual production, right? Is this modern club music if you're a CHR? Is that like an acoustic pop type of music if you're AC format? What type of instrumentation is really important for that format? Is it the bold synths or like the big sound for CHR? Is it that elegant piano and that the chill out music selection you have for a smooth jazz program. What mood, right, do we talk about? Like, is it energetic? Is it calm? Is it relaxed? What, what mood is your brand sounding like? That's really something you should, you should elaborate and think about before you just start throwing stuff together in your production room, right? Or if you just go to somebody and Lindsay going to hone in on this later and just said, just do something, just produce me a few sweepers. It could be far more than that if you want to do it right. Last is rhythm and tempo, self-explanatory. Is it more upbeat? Is it relaxed? Is it fast paced? Depending on the music, what do you want to achieve? I think that's, that's kind of like, that's kind of like the basics. If you look at the brand from the music side of things, imaging wise, right? I'm not talking music analysis and formal music programming. Then second, second point would be pick a music service or an imaging library that fits to that needs because you need an arsenal that you can use for creating actual production. Choose a voiceover, really important point. So people overlook it often and just pick some guy or some girl, but that's not the way to go because the voiceover has more talking time than any of your DJs, jocks, moderators, however you want to call it. Really important, talks more than your morning show. So picking the right voice for your brand is really crucial. So really like play around with it. Do maybe focus group, 
define your stations through the voiceover and make it make it the right decision. Like don't overdo it, of course, but think about it wisely, what voiceover you choose, because that's the person representing your brand the most, right? So if you have that, and hopefully um, you could, you should definitely see, we need the next slide, I think, Lindsay. Um, you need to see where's the touch point in my hour. And I just wrote that down from a station I monitored in the morning here um, in uh, Cape Town. Um, you see like all these segments is like, where actually imaging hits the airwaves. So that's a lot of touching points. So it's really important, right? It's really important that you really think about it. Like when this elements hit, like what is happening after that element? How is the jock using it? And Lindsay is gonna go into that in far more detail in his Pro Tools session. But I think it's crucial if you want station flow, if you want the music to be sounding great with each other, that you really think about what you do between the songs, what you could see here with station ID or on ramp, which then basically mean the moderator is gonna do it. But it's really important that you define these touching points in your hot clock or in your hour, and then see like how the elements fit, fit in with the music and with the pace you're setting. I mean, everyone can do this exercise with their own station, but I think it's really crucial. And you will find out a lot of things you have been overlooking and you might wonder like, why is this not sounding as great as I produced it in the studio when it's actually on the air, somebody else is touching it or some other circumstances are happening there too. So it's really important that you visualize and make sure you understand where your element's sitting in the clock and that you pro produce it that specific way. And my last point, and this ties in, I think, with a lot of questions or some questions um, Neil's going to have later, and that's be the last slide. You really need to think about the touching points of your brand in general. And speaking radio, this sounds weird to you because you see a car and this has been done for a car brand, but I'll use that for all the radio stations I consult and work with all the time because it's really important all the for radio stations. You're not an FM only anymore. You're like a broadcasting, a media broadcasting company. So your Sonic logo is gonna be inserted, social media, on air, TV, whatever, like a lot of places, right? The brand music plays an essential role today. If you want a TVC commercial, for example, there's still radio stations doing it. It's more on the on the on the automotive side here, but in general, radio stations do that as well. On the other side, like Instagram, YouTube, Facebook is a new TV, so fine, it needs to be working there as well. Of course, traditional radio, going on stage, you have your live events, also real important, your sound design works there, unveiling showrooms, some radio stations have, some not. On hold, if somebody's calling a station, maybe it's a ringtone, in-car entertainment. I mean, there's a lot of touching points. And you, if you create imaging down in your in your studio, or or if you're a program director and throw a sentence on somebody like Lindsay, just just do me a package. I need a new branding package, whatever. Just think about these things that your sound is going to touch people in different circumstances and different media all the time. And it's up, of course, to a guy like Lindsay or myself to make that possible sound wise. But still, by writing the exact and good brief, we can do far more. And I think that's perfect. Um, to go into what Lindsay wants to talk about. I think it's a really important topic, often, often overlooked, and I'm more than happy that Lindsay's gonna share his findings about creative briefs and how to, how to make them basically a real, a real deal. I'll get them in reality now. So Lindsay, it's all yours. Cool, thanks Andy. Uh, just give me one second while I unshare a screen. Where's my mouse? And... My mouse has disappeared. <laughs> um, screen share. Okay, cool. So I hope that you can all see my Pro Tools screen. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Give me just one more second. I just need to get uh, rid of something else and then just bring up some of my notes here as well is it there yes let me put that there no what happened there we go <clears throat> i hope that's on pro tools so what i want to talk about is you know it's a it ties in a lot with what andy was saying and i want to bring it to a real world or real life example 
um, that I came across recently. Um, just give me one second. I just need to open my notes. It says it's already open. It was there a moment ago. I just need to find it. There we go. Okay. So I want to talk about the importance of a brief to an image producer. And I want to take it back a couple of weeks ago. I got a, uh, an imaging brief from a Benstown station. Uh, it was a CHR format and it was four and a half pages worth of production filled with sweepers, liners. And for those of you in, you know, in the studio, you know, like four and a half pages of, of imaging and liners is, is a fair amount of work. The most I had to go with was it's a rebrand, a relaunch. There's a new station voice and, you know, it's CHR format. There were some usual things like uh, top of hours, uh, out of breaks, you know, et cetera. But there was nothing additional for me to latch on to. Um, I completed the project, of course, but it came with a fair amount of difficulty in that I struggled to find ways to imagine how it was going to be implemented on air what they were going to do with it, where they were going to place it, and how they were going to use it. And I think a lot of audio producers make the mistake sometimes of throwing everything, including the kitchen sink, at it, you know, because we want it to sound big and bold. But sometimes, you know, without the right brief, we miss the mark. And we find that it doesn't sit well on air or, you know, it's not just gelling well or the way you thought it was going to be used it's not been used in that sort of light. Um, take it forward a week and a half after that. I got another brief from a Benstown station and it was a, it was a shorter brief in terms of the, the amount of production. This time it was for a hot AC station. But this brief was full on. Uh, it gave me a whole bunch of notes that I could use to go ahead and, and produce. So I want to take you through that session um, and just show you what insight the, the, the station's brief gave me in order to produce it. So I'll read some of the notes and, and I'm, I'm assuming it was the PD who passed on these notes, um, but I'll read the overall notes of the station, um, what the station is about, what they're trying to achieve. And then I'll go into each piece and I'll just try and explain after each piece um, what my thinking was behind it. And hopefully, you know, um, what I have realized with Pro Tools and Zoom, if you're on an iPad, you'll probably listen to it in mono. Uh, if you're on a laptop or normal computer, you probably will hear it in stereo. So if you're on one of those smaller devices, you might lose some of the detail. But, you know, the overall uh, production style and the approach will still come through. So if I read through the station notes, the overall production notes it was hot AC, but edgy, up tempo and clean, not aggressive or heavy, but leaning top 40 with a friendly yet with a number one station in town kind of vibe. Not at all an AC light sound, but driving positive beds, clean effects without a lot of reverb and the imaging should cut through and sound clean yet big, whether it's laying over a soft intro song or on its own to reestablish the energy level of the station. So off the bat, that already gave me, you know, a great view of what the station sounds like, what they want it to sound like, and how I should go ahead and produce the imaging. So I'll jump straight into that with a couple of examples. So the first one is a top of our legal ID. And I would imagine in the US, they need to play this, uh, you know, every hour just to reestablish who they are. So the note on the top of our legal ID read, end dry right at or before coast 93.1. So the very end is cold, no trail or echo in case the next song starts cold. So I'll just play that quickly. WMGX, WMGX HD1, Portland, Maine. The Blake Show in the morning and hit music all day. We get you. Coast 93.1. Help me. It's like the walls. 
So what I'm trying to do in this session is just simulate what it might sound like on air. And to me, that was speaking to the brief. It was clean. It's clear to me that the PD of the station is very particular about the sound that they want. So that for me was clean. It's not wow production, but it's meeting the brief for the station. So the second example I want to play is a piece of production, similar, pretty much the same, but what I, the approach I may have taken if there was no brief attached to it. And this would be to play the music bed or production elements or whatever the case is all the way till the end, because, you know, that's, I guess we, we're guilty of that at the best of times, you know, we fill up everything. So let me play that. WMGX, WMGX HD1, Portland, Maine. The Blake Show in the morning and hit music all day. We get you. Coast 93.1. It's like the walls are caving in. So with that piece, there was production all the way till the end. There was even a little delayed voiceover, which kind of clashed with the intro of the song and it went against what the brief was asking for. Uh, if I move on to the next bit, sorry if I move my Pro Tools screen a bit fast, I apologize. Uh, the next batch was for position layovers. And the notes for this section was, it should start with effects so it can run clean out of a cold song, then light swooshes so the entire thing can lay over an intro, but quick enough so that the effects can also... But, but quick with just enough effects so it can also run on its own over a cold intro song. So there's, there's two types of executions that they're looking for here. The one over the intro of a song and the one starting cold, and I'll play both. Coast 93.1. Turn it up! With the Blake Show in the morning and the hit music you like all day. So that one was... Again, very clean um, and exactly what the station wanted. Here's a version where it's on its own as the alternative uh, execution and into a cold intro song. Coast 93.1. Turn it up! With the Blake Show in the morning and the hit music you like all day. And then the last one, just to flip it on its head, just to show you the extreme part of it, is, you know, music all the way to the end. Coast 93.1. Turn it up! With the Blake Show in the morning and the hit music you like all day. Cool. So if I move on to the next batch which is labeled as rejoiners. The note says, start with big effects, transition out of spots, then end dry on 93.1 of Coast 93.1 since they go into music. So these kind of notes tells me that the PD has really thought about how it's going to be executed on air and where they need to place them. And for me, as, a, as an audio producer, it makes me work more efficiently, more effectively. Um, I think you can, while the production is not wow and blazing and in your face, I believe, um, you know, it, it allows you still to be creative in that, but, you know, ultimately giving the station what they want. So I'll just play these rejoiners. You can't get this collection in any store. Get it now. Let's get it going. Hit music 24-7. And laugh it up with The Blake Show from 5 to 10 a.m. Rocking your radio. Right here. Coast 93.1. And then this one, if I remember correctly, was, again, just flipping it on his head and just trying to show you what it might sound like. There's no right or wrong here, you know, Um I guess every format requires slightly different approaches. Um, so the next piece that I'm going to play, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but in some instances, it might just be a little bit messy on air. You know, when, like uh, Andy was saying earlier, you don't know how the jock or the on-air talent is going to use that. 
um, you know, at that moment in time, because you've got multiple jocks coming through the studio and they all interact with the, the production pieces, you know, in a different way with the way they feel comfortable with. Can't get this collection in any store. Get it now. Wake up with you next to me. Mornings with Blake, Kelly, and Todd. No one better. And hit music 24 7. I love it. Woo! It's Coast 93 1. So the notes on this segment was end die on Coast 93 1. And that one was obviously not die. Um, and again, it's not what they were looking for. Um, I just want to pause here for one second and maybe just highlight the importance. I know um, production people usually stay in the studio and that's what they do. And technical people stay on the FM transmission side. Uh, throughout my radio career, I've always had one foot in production and one foot in, in technical. And I found that was quite valuable to me because, and I think it's important for image producers to not necessarily get involved in, you know, the full on technical aspects of the radio station, but to understand how the systems work and how operators use the system in studio. So, you know, one important thing for me is, you know, just consider how the automation playout system is set up, you know, because sometimes the, the auto marker of a production piece might be set too early and then you come in with a, a cold song and then it and then it crashes you know so you, you're not getting that consistency on air so i do think it's it's vital for an audio producer to not only know pro tools or logic or adobe edition but also to know what the the the, the playout system is like and 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 how it operates and i think what is obviously helpful is to drive the desk at some point in your production career a live on air desk um, to see how you yourself interact with the imaging and, and the music. Uh, the next batch is labeled into spots. And I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's a quick bump, quick effects, where it usually will enter into a segment or go into spots. I don't have one of these segments at hand, but you know, we go into a spot break. And the idea here I got from, from the brief is that no frills, no fuss, just quick, uh, establish the mes message, um, establish the, the, the station, and move on into spots. The Blake Show, Blake Show. on Coast 93.1. Order this collection online at .com. And then this is just another example. The Blake Show with Kelly and Todd. Every morning on Coast 93.1. You can't get this collection in any store. Get it now. So again, very quick, doing its job keeping the station clean. Uh, the last segment that I want to go through here is uh, labeled layover breakfast show. And the notes was uh, start with quick effects and whooshes under so it can lay over a song intro. And that's again, pretty straightforward. Hey. The Blake Show, real funny. Mornings on Coast 93.1. And I've just got one or two more examples just to illustrate that. Coast 93.1, The Blake Show with Kelly and Todd. Real funny. I'm at a party I don't want to be at. And I don't ever wear a suit and tie. And then the final one. Wake and Blake. All morning. The Blake Show with Kelly and Todd on Coast 93.1. This world can hurt you. It cuts you deep. Okay. So that's the demo of the production if you will and for me you know the branding idea it always starts with the copy and the creative concept and in in radio's case it, it almost always includes the spoken word and i think you know it should the word should be the guiding concept and the creative idea behind the production often i see you know uh, imaging sweepers being written with with no concept behind them but somehow you know magically you know, things need to appear from within inside the computer and make them fit seamlessly on air. And without a proper brief, chances are you're probably going to get to a situation where it's not gelling on air. You know, uh, for me, you know, programming or the PD, they need to give input on the imaging scripts to paint a picture for the image producer 
you know, things like, like I've said previously, where and how they'll be used. And it really gives you an insight into the programming clock and what type of cohesion you need to match with your production. Because, you know, like the, the title of the session suggests that production is the glue that keeps everything together on air and it can't sit isolated. I think, you know, a lot of producers make the mistake of, of listening to your own production and other people's production in isolation. You don't hear it in the mix. You don't hear it on air. You don't hear it coming in and out of songs. Um, and while it sounds hot in your studio or when you upload it to all these, you know, platforms, uh, SoundCloud and that kind of stuff, it's all a composite of just the audio production. But very rarely is it mixed in to simulate what happens on air, you know. And and uh, the creative, you know, is uh, is a collaborative effort. And the more input you can give and the more notes you can give on that, you know, I, I think the end result will be better. I think there'll be less revision that the producer needs to do and it will sit seamlessly on air. And I know one of the questions that Neil has is why does, you know, imaging always sound so, so noisy with zaps and bangs and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And we can get to that question, you know, when, when we get there, but for me, I just want to reiterate and, and it made me realize again, when I got this brief, how important it is to brief the, image producer on what it is that you're looking for. And I think sometimes, you know, having worked inside radio stations for, for quite a long time, we take it for granted or the team takes it for granted that everyone knows what is expected of them. And while it should be, uh, sometimes you still need that input, you know, from, from the copywriter to the PD, to the music programmer, you know, just, and if you don't have that information, the notes that was passed on, by the PD of the station, you know, go and ask them, you know, where is this going to be used? How is it going to be used, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. That's key. I mean, that's really key. I want to hone in really quick on what you said in composites. Um, I mean, I think in the last 15 years, I've interviewed and listened to composites of hundreds of like imaging producers. And it's very different in my experience, like where you can hear on a SoundCloud link, having the best work, crop together in two minutes without any contest at uh, context compared to what's actually on the air on those stations. And I think it's really important to evaluate what's actually going on the air and how it's going to sound in the entire package, not just like isolated on a sound call link. Absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, uh, uh, I don't necessarily think that the production that I illustrated is mind blowing, um, but it speaks to what the PD was looking for what the station wants to sound like. And that is the ultimate key, you know? I agree. I mean, it co correlates with the, with the brand principles we discussed about before, right? So we want to go ahead and do the basic principles, Neil, before you jump into questions or? Well, you can go ahead with the brand principles. That's good. Okay, perfect. So let's, let's, let's finish that. I'll go ahead and just share some. I love the sharing like a few principles with, with everyone. It's pretty simple and pretty self-explanatory. So my production tips for all of you guys is use aux returns to save power. Simple, but still works. Try reverb to glow stuff together. Grid mode for music production. I find grid is key. It's working in Pro Tools and other DAWs as well. Working key, if possible, if you do musical stuff. I mean, we could fill an entire hour about working key, but I'll just leave that standing as is. My favorite thing to do. Um, if you ever checked out my work, pretty much everything is in key and in tune. I think that makes it flow better, but just a personal preference. But I think it helps you to get like a music sound, a music station sounding better. And then think about the listener first. And let's say that that was throwing the entire arsenal. Think about the listener and the station you work for first before about like what you like and about the new tricks you want to try out. That's that's really important. So that would be from my end. Some production tips on, on my end, uh, I can't really say that it, it's production tips per se, but I think what's important to me at least is to know your production resources, whatever that might be, whether it's a, uh, a production library that, that you have where, you know, it's, it's, it's updated on a weekly basis. Go in, download those updates, have a listen to them all, know what you're working with. So when you, when you start your next batch of imaging, you know what type of music beds you got. You, so you're not grabbing at things on the last minute. It speeds up your workflow and it speeds up your production time to you know hit the nail on the head. Um, also, 
in your production service, I feel one of the most important things for me at least is music beds. You know, the quality of the music beds, are they consistent? Because that speaks to building consistency in your station sound, you know, from week to week, month to month. So yeah, you know, the, the music beds is a vital part. And, and, and I'll just say like when Andy and I first started interacting, this was what, about seven years ago, right, Andy? I was at yeah. Smile at the time and we were looking for a, a production service. And eventually we, we, we signed one of, um, well, I say we, but Smile signed one of um, Benstown's production services. And the key element for me there was the music beds. You know, sound effects, S effects, bushes, zaps, bangs, those things are vital. But I think, you know, if, you, if you're in a music format, the, the, the quality of the music beds are, are very important. And what I found in that specific library was that, you know, I could move to any music bed in the catalog and the bass felt the same. The detail in the bass felt the same. The mix sounded the same from music bed to music bed. It just builds overall consistency, you know? Um, this is an important one, I think. Um, you have to be a team player, right? I think it's the, personally, I think it's the PD's responsibility to move the station forward as a whole. And your job as an image producer is to become a cog in that wheel. And with your skill set, you know, help everyone move the station forward together. Um, you know, um, not, not to try and be the star all alone with your, you know, awesome production because, you know, you can throw everything, including the kitchen sink, and it's just not sitting well on air. And then the final thing from me is um, Andy dubbed this last week when we were discussing flow check. Um, you know, once your production piece is done, mute all your voice tracks and your listener clips and that kind of stuff and and just play the the production from start to finish for me it, it has to have a start a middle and an end and you know without the voiceover in there it kind of highlights you know the areas that might need some work um you know might need a bit of tidying up um and then you can really check whether your piece of production is flowing you know where there's nothing jumping out you know offbeat or 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 weird or that kind of thing. Yep. Neil? Got it. A couple of points here. Just before we get into the Q&A, um, if you want to voice note us, you can send your voice note to 0795280000. And please, any questions or comments, you can do those at the bottom of your Zoom page. Because I think you guys hit a lot of stuff. And Andy, when you started off saying, <clears throat> it's not just radio anymore, it's online it's on hold, it's web, it's social media, it's even eventing when you're out in an event and the station's doing the OB or using a PA system and, and really knowing how to touch, because we, we have so many touch points with, with our audiences. Also, another great point that I think is fundamentally important is knowing the tech and the IT and the equipment and the sound systems and the mixing desks and all the other equipment that go into this. And, and, and Lindsay, to your point, I mean, one of my handovers uh, when leaving a station is to make sure that the people that are taking your, your place actually understand, you know, where the compressor is, where the audio processor is, what these things do. Because, you know, guys are, are, are doing, doing production, they're technical pr producers who are using Adobe or Adobe Gold and, and doing stuff for inserts on air and not really understanding each other's space and like the station. So it's really important to understand how all these departments and what they're doing with audio um, uh, and how they fit together. And they think about working in isolation. I mean, I started off as a sound engineer, as a tech, tech producer, like as well. And sometimes when you did a production or you, you did some work, you'd phone your buddy at the next station and say, hey man, listen to this. Listen how how I mixed the I panned this and I compressed that and I flanged this and I you know and, and sometimes I I do think that that sound engineers get stuck in their own bubble and they're mm. only making production for themselves okay. and that's not in isolation to the PD or the clients or even the copywriter you know they get the brief but it's just all about me 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 you know kind of thing but 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 first things first you you're producing audio editing audio for a, a wide range. So you're talking about radio, it's getting compressed, it's going through the processor, it's going to the tra transmitter, it's going through an eight ohm speaker or a 16 ohm speaker. You're doing stuff on the internet, you're doing stuff. Your, your, your audio production is going across a myriad 
of outputs. What are, <clears throat> are all these the same? Do, do you mix them the same? Do you compress them the same? Or do you treat them differently? Lucy, you want to go first or? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. I think, you know, you have to be aware of where all the devices and the channels that the audio is going to be played out to or from. But I think that it's probably a hefty task to do a mix for each one of them. You know, so radio streams across uh, across apps, uh, but, but the primary sort of channel is the transmitter. So in this instance, I would say, you know, mix to your, 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 your primary channel, which is the FM transmitter, but be aware that, you know, the other platforms might be affected. For, for one quick example is your stereo panning. I think, you know, it's, it, it goes without saying that when you flip it to mono, you, you, you lose a lot of, um, you know, placement and, and imaging, if you will, in the left and right. Um, so while it's very cool to do, you know, extreme left and right panning on FM, chances are, you know, if someone's listening to it on a, on a small little speaker in their office, they're going to lose that effect. So I, I think be, be mindful of that. But unless you're doing multiple streams and they're all running separately, I think you're going to have a very difficult task mixing for them all. Um, I think, you know, pick the main one and then work predominantly towards that, but be mindful of the other stuff. So, for example, uh, listening to stuff on your mobile phone, you know, um, yeah. I've experienced that mm. the higher frequencies are going to sound a little bit harsher. You know, you're going to lose a lot of detail in the low end. I found that when I listen to a mix that I've done on, on my studio speakers and I listen to it on my phone, I have to bump up the music bed a little bit more for it to cut through on a phone. You know, so I think it's a, it's a case of trial and error. But in this instance, we're talking about radio. And if FM transmitter is your primary thing uh, or, or channel or medium, then, then I think, you know, consider that. As, as, as the main one. You know, as long as we've been in radio, we've been given style guides. The newsroom has a style guide. <clears throat> on air as a style guide. I've never come across a production style guide. And to this I day... I did a couple, Neil. I did a couple in my life. I wrote <laughs> a couple of production style guides in my life. But I, I'm still confused as to the difference between a jingle, a positioner, a liner, a drop, a bumper, and a sweeper. You know... <laughs> because production guys just it rolls off your tongue and people just think it's jingle or production or positioners. I mean, but they, these are specific things that are used like Andreas when he did the hot clock around intros, outros, sweepers, liners. So put us out of our misery and, and, and give us a, a, a quick answer to that. I mean, oh, no. I think there is no quick answer. I think you're absolutely right. Like different people are going to tell like different things, uh, like what the naming convention is going to be. I'll just give a um, quick example. So sweeper, for example, is everywhere considered under production guys. It's like a drop in just music and sound effects to it. Like a drop in could be also rollover in the United States or a liner in the UK. So it's a very, you're right. There's like separate words for things, but most of the production guy, guys will understand it. If you talk style guy, I thought you mean more like a definition about what the production style is going to be. That's why I said I wrote a couple. So for a lot of station I consult and work with like, I usually do like kind of like style guys. So the production people, when I leave or like they never see me again, they just stay in like some of the boundaries I defined with their bosses over themselves to what the sound of the entire station based on that principle I alluded before on, uh, should be. So I think the style guide is as important as the naming convention you, you said. And I think the most important thing is that the jocks know like what the name is going to be in the system when they play out the stuff or the guy puts like the automated hours together. They should definitely know like what the, what the naming convention should be. Absolutely right. We've got a question here from Christine Fenter, who's a station manager in Namibia just up the road. She says, any tips for adjusting the sound at the station sound from show to show without losing the brand's core, core value? Example, breakfast show is high tempo followed by medium uh, temper mid-morning and lunch shows with vastly different personalities presenting. And then her second part is, not sure if I'm phrasing this right, but any advice for production elements when the programming is automated? A lot of stations are doing automation to, 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 to save costs. We find that uh, sectones don't do much to help segue production elements into music without any silence. Yeah, 
Okay, I would do one. Let's see, would you do two? Yeah. I uh, think I forget what two was, but maybe you, you should. Yeah, no, two is two is your alley. Two is the playout system, like the, <laughs> yeah. the, the automation. I think that's <laughs> yeah. Automation. Your alley. So, um, I think it's a great question, Christine, and um, I think the station sound should vary between mornings. I mean, that's just my personal opinion, but I think it's a clever way because you'll always have different times of day, different moods. I mean, there's research proves that. So, I would definitely adjust my imaging throughout the day. In tone and tempo. I mean, I'm not radically, but I'll definitely would work on that. So I think, for example, if your morning show is like a spectacular, like really entertaining morning show, there's nothing like forbidding yourself to give that morning show more exciting package than like a midday presenter who's like literally like talking to the moms who are at home and like uh, after the kids are gone to school or something. I think it's really important to hone in on this behavior of the listener, and you could do this really well by adjusting the imaging to it. And I, I think adjusting is the word, but radically changing is like, you should adjust to the actual like mood of the day if this is wanted. So it's a, definitely a tactic people could use and we've used it a couple of times for some stations like with big morning shows that we did like a night night show type of packages, nightlife show like with brass and like a lot of like, there would be a real big band involved and stuff. I think there's a lot of possibilities uh, in that field. So, and, so to answer the, the, the second half of that question, I think it comes down to knowing how the system works, the playout system um, in, in, in this instance. You need to, for example, if you ingest a song into a playout system, uh, and let's say it's a, it's a fade, the song ends on a fade or there's a decay on the song, you know, one sustained note. To keep the rhythm of the station and the energy up, you need to be placing that out cue point um, or uh, in the system that I'm used to, uh, Genesis, Orgs Mark, you need to place that at a very specific point. Uh, but it also speaks to the type of brief that you've given your production person about how that piece comes in and how it goes out and where it's sitting on the clock or in the clock at least. So I, I, the out cue and in cue points are, are vital in this instance when you're doing automation on a system. I don't think it's a... It's a ingest it and, and leave it. You need to be quite precise about where you place these things so that you, you have cohesion on air and that everything is mixing well together. Okay, quickly. Um, what kind of free online tools? You know, not everyone is working in the same kind of sophisticated studios with resources and, and equipment that you guys are, are using. But what free online tools and kind of tutorials can you suggest for uh, prospective audio engineers and sound and sound designers? Yeah, I mean, online there is a lot of resources that you want to learn about sound design and imaging. Um, I think YouTube is a great source. My friend Brendan Tacy started putting up videos like in 2005, so there's a lot of stuff like on YouTube. Um, you can go to my blog, this blog, Ben's Town blog. If you Google that, you'll find it. There's a lot of like tips and tricks, interview with imaging people I did over the last couple ten years. Um, video tutorials on there as well. Um, and there's a lot of resources. So you just get in touch with people. You think they do great things. I, I'm pretty sure if you drop Lindsay, I'll say Lindsay, so nobody writes me an email. So like, <laughs> if you want to drop Lindsay an email later and ask all that questions, like he's going to answer that for sure. No, I mean, I think it's a very good community. The radio imaging community is a very good community. And um, whoever like you got an email and you like, it's going to hit you back and then going to help you along the way because it's the way we all got like into that is like somebody helped us along the way and showed us things. And I think that's a, that's a reasonable thing. Also, there's, I think Pro Tools has even a free version these days. Like there is possibilities, of course, not with all the bells and whistles, but if you just want to start, there's pretty decent options um, available for like far less money than a couple of years ago. Um, the world has changed dramatically here. I don't know like what the subscription fees are for audition these days, but I assume it's far lower than it used to be like a couple of years ago. Same goes for Pro Tools and then other DAWs. They all have like free versions meanwhile. And there's a lot of lot of stuff in, in included already, right? In that in that you can just get a cracked you can just get a cracked version on. No, 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 no. It's not what you do, Neil. It's not no, Neil. <laughs> not here. Okay, bad, bad thing. Look, I Neil, didn't say that. Take that back. Just to extend that question a bit, um, because I know you also asked it previously, what if they don't have a budget, you know, for production mm. resources? Yeah. That's a very difficult one. And I think, you know, for station management, production is usually, you know, the guys in the corner, 
who who don't need plugins and who don't need software updates and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's important for them to understand that without those things, you know, you you chances are you you're probably not going to get a very competitive sound. So I would suggest, and and I'd hope that you know they go this route is is assign some budget to something, even if it's buyout libraries, you know, because there's 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 quite a bit out there. For sure, you'll run through them very quickly and you'll exhaust them because, you know, there's only so many times you can use one music bed, you know, in in multiple pieces of production before it gets tired. But, you know, the more buyout libraries you buy over time, you know, the, the bigger your, your resource bank will get. But further to that, you know, what I've done from time to time is, and I'll use this example, swooshes and whooshes and you know soft kind of sounds that you can layer under production i've there's, there's some software developers that you know gives you full trial for let's say 15 days you know and and download those things and start generating your own sounds you know um, mangle it up and and save it because i've done that in the past and it's still some of the sounds that i use today you know it's it's still relevant um, and it's not, it's not glaringly obvious that it's, oh, it's that sound, but it's just filler sounds, if you will, in, in this example. And, you know, if, you, if you're getting a Pro Tools subscription, for example, or Logic or whatever the case is, there's a whole bunch of free instruments that come with it. You know, take some time out. And I know it's, you know, easier said than done, but take some time out and, you know, create a couple of beds, if you will, loops. And I mean, there's, uh, there's, there's so many free archival audio uh, sites as well, where, you know, they're national libraries and, you know, Europe or the UK or the US that, that have audio that, that, that you can use as well. Like not just historical stuff, but, but pretty yeah. up-to-date stuff. There's a very important question here. Johan Forster says, hi guys, thanks for the, all the info. What are your thoughts on using multiple voices as station voices? I mean, in my experience, I've always wanted a male and female as the core imaging like voices. That's the combination, and then, huh? <laughs> and, then, and then for promotions, have a totally station pr promotions and events a totally different voice so you know you're isolating what the positioning of the like of like of the station is versus so what are your ideas around that i mean there is there is uh successful stations doing multiple different things right i really think it depends highly on the state of the market what the competition is doing what do you think fits to your brand uh, perfect uh, i remember amp in la when they launched and this is like a couple of years ago when la just had like one Big CHR, which was Kiss FM and Amp Radio launch in LA. There's their um, their imaging producer Jay Kaplan, who's a dear friend and really talented guy, and did like a totally different thing. While Kiss FM was that big and bold and like everything was on a beat and powerful and straightforward thing with like a very big male and a very significant female uh, voice, Kelly Doherty. Amp was using like a ton of different voices and just threw it together in a very random way, like kind of like a YouTubeification of radio imaging just to sound different. So I think there's space in the market for everything if it's done strategically and right and if it fits the brand, right? I would never be against or for something like that. I think it's an actual analysis of the situation that makes you that makes you feel if this is the right thing to do or not. If you're like a CHR and you want to like come to your audience like pretty random and not like self-explanatory and not want to talk down i think it's a great great idea to use multiple voices and use as much as voice as possible and just like maybe one voice just say the station name and the rest you do with listeners and artists and just random people to to give it that like more real type of feeling like i think power in la did this a couple a couple of years ago as well um by using such so many listener grabs on the air that you couldn't actually say what the station voice is so i think there's it's a great tactic to to just be different, and it's definitely not a pro or contra. It's just the context who makes that. Like, yeah, look, I, I've listened to a lot of Nova stuff that they did in Australia, which was totally left of center. I mean, the, it's almost like they didn't have a station voice; they just used voices and effects and 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 audio pieces. I mean, it was quite refreshing to hear like a brand new approach as opposed to the old traditional. Yeah. There was a question here, um, or rather, a comment saying greetings. How important is it to maintain your style of production while meeting the client's brief? I want to answer that and say, you don't have a style. It's the client's brief and the station's brief. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think people are going to hire, it depends, like people are going to hire you for your style if you like have a certain specific style, right? A John Frost is always going to be hired for rock format in a certain specific style. 
Um, a guy who does like great hip hop stuff, most of the time is going to be hired for specific bad stuff. I mean, I think it's the crown jewel and the, what I try to talk to with, with the people I work with and, and, and I train is like a great imaging producer is like you said, Neil, he can basically address every type of style because mm. you'll find experts in every segment. But for me, like the champion is the guy who could like image a country station in the morning, like that, do an urban and, and, and like R&B or hip hop station in the afternoon and then finish up like with a country branding. You know, that's kind of like for me, that's the people who I really think are awesome in what they do because they're flexible and they're like, they're versatile and, and can address different briefs. I think it's really important to to do that because that's what so you, you need to know. You, you need to know Kung Fu, Tai Chi, Judo, Taekwondo and everything yeah. else. At the end of the day, it's all the same, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but in that, just to add to that, I mean, you know, to Andy's point about, you know, starting on country in the morning, CHR in the afternoon, and then, you know, rhythmic hip hop in, in the afternoon or evening, um, you'll still be able to bring your vibe to it. You know, I, I believe that every producer has their own vibe. Um, and yes, you need to meet the brief of the station and the sound of the station, but you're still giving some of your vibe to it. So whether you're working on a country station or, you know, a rhythmic station in the evening, you're still adding your vibe to it, your own special vibe that, that no one else is going to be able to, to do. Okay, Andy, they're asking for your style guides in, in the questions. And also, do you offer any training for guys like us who want to learn imaging apart from YouTube? Do Benstown offer any kind of training, et cetera, um, outside? That's a good question. I mean, I always wanted, like, I always wanted to do this in terms of, like, webinars or, but it's really a time thing on my end, to be really honest. I mean, I love doing that stuff, and I did it far more often when I was not as involved you know, a lot of other stuff as I'm right now. Um, you can always reach out to me and every time I'm going to like give feedback or think what we can do differently. I think um, to that point, let's, tr I'll try to, to sit with my team and work on something that could be comprehensive and that could be like ex exist like on a longer period of time because it needs time to get people basically to a certain level. And I think it, if we do something, I like to do things the right way. So I don't want to promise it, but it's definitely worth the discussion and worth like a, a chat amongst the team. If we could not come up with something where we could like give people the opportunity to, to dig in and learn more and maybe qualify for a role or whatever. I think it's a step would be definitely a good thing to do for sure. The other thing that you spoke about, you know, the, the session wasn't only for sound engineers and sound like designers, it's for programmers, people involved in the outputs of lack of a station and um you know it's you have these we go to immense uh, effort and and resources and money to do these packages these imaging packages and then you'll find you know presenters doing their own production and then going into the back end and loading their own stuff how do you handle that um yeah i mean i worked with presenters who did this in the past um let's say like out of like 95 like one was really good at doing it so the point is like i'm not going to start a career as dj or as a presenter tomorrow so i think the guys who work as a presenter should focus on like what they're good at not saying that their feedback is not vital i think the feedback if a presenter does that it strictly means that he doesn't feel hurt by the pd or by the people who put together the outlines for his show because otherwise you would not would do it, right? If you would have somebody like Lindsay and you could go to and say, hey, bro, I need like whatever X elements for my show and it should sound then that way. And I discussed that with our PD, that'd be the perfect scenario for me. So I, I think it's, it has its pros and cons, right? I like people who do stuff on, their, on themselves and on their own because it shows effort and it shows that they're willing to, to get their game up and change something. The question is just how you, from a strategic uh, position bring that into a channel that makes sense for everyone right mm -hmm. you have that totally freaked out night show and the guy doesn't hurt anybody he wants to do this stuff why not if he's a great talent and the, the listener will love him and if he if he makes great quota like why should you forbid him doing this just because my ego doesn't play a role in that type of decisions for me right so if i have somebody my stations he would do that it would be awesome the pd would be fine and the quote and the ratings great good for me Okay, just, just before we, like, like we wrap up, um, we're talking a lot about station imaging positioning. What about podcasting and uh, short and long formats of, of interviews and inserts? Um, where are those playing roles in, in audio production? Um, 
I mean, podcasting is, is a massive, uh, massive field, right? I mean, you've got like fully produced podcasts, you got interview podcasts. I think it also here needs to fit the podcast you do, right? I mean, I, I always use the example because we also do more, far more podcast production than a year ago, right? I mean, it's everywhere. We, I got hit up like basically every day by people asking for resources, podcast production itself. Um, I use that example. Everybody knows Tim Ferriss. I think his podcast is downloaded like 500 million times. There's almost no production to it or very weak production in terms of intro and outro. And then you have like fully produced, like really great produced podcasts, but they don't have any audience, right? I think podcast is like where radio used to be like 50 years ago, right? It's a very open field and a play box for, for a lot of people. So I think giving advice, of course, as an audio guy, I'd love to be every podcast be like produce awesome, but I don't think if you're a great talent and you have something to tell, a story to tell, it just supports the story. If you're not a great talent, you can do whatever with the production. It's not going to help you in a podcast market because it's a direct consumer driven business. It's not a business to business transaction. It's a direct consumer business with a lot of different opportunities, like far more than radio. Like you will have 10 radio stations in the market, but a thousand podcasts. So 15,000, whatever. If you speak English, millions. So I think, uh, yeah, I definitely, if I had a podcast, I'll definitely produce it the right way. But I also think there's a lot of great podcasts out there. They're not imaged perfectly, but they have great listenership and followership. And Lindsay, quickly, just in terms of working in commercial radio, would you, as an engineer and a sound person, prefer that presenters and producers pre-record an interview, edit it down, you know, keep it tidy as opposed to do, doing things a lot? I don't know. I think it has its pros and cons. Um, you know, if you... If you edit stuff, you you, you kind of take the life out of it in a way, especially in, a, in an interaction, a conversation with someone. Um, if it calls for that, if there's a lot of, you know, repetition or stop start or, you know, ums and ahs and that kind of stuff, that's going to take up the feature time um, instead of getting to, you know, the content of it, then probably, yeah, go ahead and edit it. But, you know, if, you, if you're really good at interviewing people and keeping the conversation on track, then, then live is the way to go because, you know, you, you, you get that interaction with someone immediately, you know, and, and you can hear when something is live and when something's being chopped up and edited because, you know, all the life is out of it. Yeah. I also think it depends on the talent. I'll, I work with talent who were able to entertain for half an hour, like, and it was awesome. And you thought in five minutes, I work with talent on radio stations. They did a interview with a chopped up to a minute 30 and was boring so i think it really depends on the talent right neil how would you do it as a programmer like would you basically create a role for your people or like a rule or would you make that flex horses for courses yeah <laughs> to me, it's, a, it's a flexible thing but sometimes i hear stuff on air that i think you know it's like material is the, the best interview nice to have you can edit and then something that's gone on air that, God, how did it get there? You know, like, how did we allow this to get on air? You know? <laughs> so it's almost like a, like, a fil like a filter system. But just the last question, Luke, we suddenly in the last five or 10 minutes, we've had a, a load of questions which we're not going to get to because we're out of time. And Andy, in, in Europe and your client base, like with Benstown, how's COVID affected the business and the operations? Okay. I mean, for us, um, we've been lucky. I mean, if you're like in the event business or in the restaurant business or like in the, in the travel industry, I think like you have a real problem. I mean, not that being said that we took a hit as well. I'm um, in the U S far worse than in Europe. I feel in Europe is rebounding depending on the country. Um, Germany was really, and I can speak for Germany in particular. I mean, Germany had a really bad April, right? I mean, we had like a, the April was a disaster. Uh, for a lot of our clients, not so much for us because we have a lot of ongoing projects, so we don't feel it that that bad. But um, I'll think a lot of the business here are going to close with like a 20% negative this year. I mean, I think like April, March, and maybe May, you can't make up at the end of the year. And the U.S. is a different discussion. I mean, if you see like how many new cases they still have, and I think the business is going to be impacted far worse than anywhere else in the world because also the biggest economy on the other side. So, I um, mean, a lot of people will get hit um, in the United States. For us as a company, working actually, um, it didn't feel very different though. I missed a personal interaction with my people, but as a lot of people work remotely, you don't have that, that much anyways, right? So like I'll speak to Lindsay in the morning and then I might do a conference call with my colleagues in Los Angeles at five or six my time, mornings their time. 
And maybe I get an email from Chris Davies in New Zealand in between. So I miss my team in Stuttgart, but like for the overall scope of the business, it's not that changing because we work with so many remote people as today, everybody can work in his home studio. It feels, feels better about it than basically you have to go to an office. So. And, and Lindsay, in your experience in Cape Town, because you're doing production for stations, but also commercial production. For yeah. So look, I mean, the way I work hasn't changed because I've been, you know, working in the studio for the last four years, pretty much, you know, in isolation. So, so that hasn't been a, a big thing for me. Uh, but South African work has definitely slowed down, you know. Um, but fortunately, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, with the Benstown crew. And, you know, on the custom imaging side, I think I, I checked in with uh, with Matt, who's the director of custom imaging. And, the, and he tells me they have like just south of 350, you know, uh, custom stations that uh, that that they do work for. So, you know, the Benstown guys have been uh, keeping me quite busy, fortunately, which I'm really grateful for. So, yeah, it's 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 affected me, but. Um, we, we march forward. <laughs> Well, Lindsay Johnson in Cape Town, Andreas Sonnemann in Stuttgart in Germany, in Europe. Thanks very much. It's been a great discussion. I mean, we really like yeah. like over time. And I just can't, you know, uh, kind of emphasize the importance that that production plays at a radio station. And um, I hope in, the, in like in the future that, you know, that we say that, you know, programmers either come from the sales or the marketing side. We need some some programmers and people higher up in from the production side because it really is a, a pivotal part to to what to do thanks for your time today there's, there's one thing i want to add quickly neil i just want to say yeah. thank you for shining a light on the traffic department because they are the unsung <laughs> heroes everything yeah, no they are they are they, they're the last to leave the building and they're probably the first to get in there yeah. and then they're the first ones being you know crapped on because a spot was missed or yeah. missing out late of the lot booking, of late booking yeah, <laughs> exactly i also want to like appreciate it very much uh, for inviting me tim Tim, I don't know if you're there or not. Um, it's always a pleasure to, to do Radio Days Africa. This year would, would have been the first I've been there physically. Couldn't make it work. If you want me, I'm coming next year, promise. Neil, thanks for everything, man. Like, I, I do really appreciate it. And I think it's these panels are really important for our industry as uh, for the imaging and production industry because it's a job that's often overlooked. And there's a lot of people out there that are really... Yeah, they're really busting and then moving forward and trying to get the stations like what they need internally or externally. And they're often overlooked and don't get the tools and, and the stuff they need compared to like the star announcer or everybody else. But remember, these guys have more airtime than anybody else on your station. And I don't know any station in the world who sucks in production, sorry my language, um, and has great ratings. I don't know any. If you know any, email it to me, Facebook <laughs> message me. Like, I'm going to, if you find one, like, you let me know. But I think it's part of the equation and it's, it's overlooked. And I thanks you guys, you, you do that for our industry. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks Thank again, you. guys. Well, look here, tomorrow is session number 14, Thursday, the 23rd of July. Uh, the subject is the SABC Project Turnaround. It'll be moderated by Franz Kruger and his guest will be Ian Plikis, who's the SABC COO. And we all know what's going on at the SABC. They were in parliament last night for two and a half hours with very little movement. In fact, they were thrown out the parliamentary uh, Zoom <laughs> meeting, I, I believe. So it's all going to be uh, no kind of guns and roses tomorrow with uh, Ian Plikis, SABC CEO on Radio Days Africa session 14, the SABC Project Turnaround. Sorry we didn't get around to all your questions. It's been a jam-packed session. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for joining this Radio Days Africa session. Click to watch or download.